Ever wonder how our big brains evolved? Well, in this video, I'm going to be talking about life and human evolution during the Neogene period or the middle to late Cenozoic era. The Cenozoic is the era that we are currently living in, and we are actually in the Quaternary period, the very latest period in the Cenozoic, but the Neogene period occurred from 23 to 2.6 million years ago, just before the Quaternary. It includes the Miocene and Pliocene epochs. And in terms of the life events that occurred during the Neogene that we'll talk about today, whales and planktonic forms radiate or diversify rapidly during the early Neogene. Forests continued to shrink due to the cooling that was occurring during the this time and grasslands continue to expand. Large grazers adapted to climate change because they obviously liked the grasslands. Arid adapted species caused cascading radiations up the food web, which we'll explain what that means in a few slides. And apes radiated and eventually left their tree climbing habitat to evolve intelligence due to climate change. And I'll explain what all that means. And obviously then humans eventually evolved from those apes that left the trees. And we radiated. So first we'll talk about pelagic or open ocean life. Many new whale species evolved during the early Neogene or the Miocene epoch. One of these was dolphins, a type of whale that radiated in the Miocene. We can see where dolphins split off from the whale phylogeny over here in this figure. Again, if you recall from the Paleogene Life video, I talked about how whales evolved from hoofed land mammals. Yes, they actually went back to the ocean and began to evolve to swim again and now are dependent on on being in the ocean. And in the Miocene, early representatives of sperm whales also evolved, which are carnivores with large teeth, and early representatives of baleen whales that strain zooplankton from seawater also appeared. Planktonic forams, however, are also one of the major events during the Miocene that occurred. They recovered greatly from the Eocene Oligocene extinction that they underwent due to the rapid cooling event that occurred at that boundary, and they expanded in the early Miocene. And they expanded so well and so widespread globally that they act as great index fossils and paleothermometers for the Miocene, Pliocene, and Quaternary. Index fossils are just fossils in the rock record that are great for relatively dating strata and correlating strata across the world because index fossils are things that were widespread and lived in a certain specific time range. And paleothermometry, when it comes to forams, means that we can understand the temperature of the water that they lived in during the time they lived because we can take oxygen isotope ratios from their shell material, their calcitic shells or tests, and we can estimate the temperature based on the oxygen isotopes. Now I talk about oxygen isotopes and indexed fossils and other videos, so I won't go on about it here. But what about the land species during the Miocene? Well, again, cooling and drying was occurring during the Miocene, so land species had to adapt to these cooler, drier environments. That means less forests and more grasslands. Like the Eocene Oligocene cooling that I talked about in the Paleogene climate video, the Miocene cooling was also due to Antarctic glaciation. The glaciation in the South Pole continued to expand and that caused further cooling in the Miocene. And we can tell this in part due to siliceous diatomaceous ooze, which is silica ooze from diatoms that spread north at the expense of carbonate precipitating organisms that formed carbonaceous ooze, which accumulated in warmer environments. So those warm adapted species were dying out and the cooler adapted species were taking over. And again, it wasn't just cooling that was the trend. It was also drying. Aridity was increasing due to less evaporation from cooler oceans, meaning less water vapor going into the atmosphere. And because of this, grasses spread over large areas in terrestrial environments where forests were shrinking. The evolutionary response to this increased aridity was actually pretty interesting. Grasses and herbs radiated as forests shrank, and due to this radiation of grasses and herbs, rats and mice, which ate the seeds from the grasses and herbs, radiated, and songbirds also then radiated because of the radiation of the herbs, and then snakes ate the rodents, the rats and mice, and they also ate the eggs of the songbirds, so then they radiated as well. So this cascading radiation of species up the food web was because of initially the increased cooling and aridity. But moving up in scale now to the larger animals, large mammals also diversified on land. Herbivores, for example, were bigger and taller with longer limbs than in the Paleogene because they had to run farther distances over the more open terrain than the densely forested terrain of the early Paleogene. Their eyesight also had to greatly improve due to increased 
increased pressure from predation. And potentially most significant for reasons I'll explain on the next slide, their teeth were longer and flatter and taller for grinding grasses because grasses contain what's called phytoliths, which translate to plant rocks because that's what they are. They are basically these silica pods in the grasses that cause the mammals to need to have really strong molar teeth that are resistant to wearing down and very long so that they wouldn't wear down and the mammals can continue to munch on them. Carnivores also continue to diversify, such as the dog and cat families that had evolved in the Paleogene, but continue to diversify throughout the Neogene. And then bear and hyena families actually evolved in the Miocene. So they hadn't evolved and they did in the early Neogene. You can see here an example of a Miocene bear, and it looks very dog-like because it evolved from a dog-like species. But around six to seven million years ago, there was a mass extinction of ungulates. However, this extinction event was very interesting because it was only specific types of ungulates with specific types of teeth that went extinct. Now we know the reason is because a switch in plant type. Due to climate change, C3 plants transitioned to mainly C4 plants in the grassland areas. So the grasses were becoming C4 grasses mainly. And we can see this in the rock record because of carbon isotopes. These two different types of plants, C3 and C4 plants, take up carbon isotopes differently. And so they make distinct carbon isotope signatures in the rock record that we can track. And at this point in our history, around six to seven million years ago, there's a distinct change from C3 to C4 grasses. And this meant that since C4 plants have sharper phytoliths, the ungulates had to have extremely tall and resistant molar teeth to survive. And those ungulates did survive, but the ungulates without these extremely tall and resistant teeth did go extinct. Now getting to the majority of this video, which is the radiation of apes and eventually human evolution. Well, the super family of apes, Hominoidea, includes modern representatives, humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and six species of gibbon. However, early on, none of these guys were present, and the first apes evolved from monkeys in Africa around 20 million years ago, and then they radiated and spread from Africa to Eurasia around 15 to 16 million years ago, just a few million years after Africa collided with Eurasia and allowed species to migrate from Africa to Eurasia. With apes also went some previously isolated mammal species like elephants and giraffes, which were able to migrate to Eurasia once they had collided. Apes radiated in both Africa and Eurasia. However, by the end of the Miocene, only one genus is known to have survived called Gigantopithecus or Gigantopithecus, Pithecus, I don't know, but you see the name there. That's the genus that survived. Then at the boundary between the Miocene and Pliocene epochs, hominins evolved. This is the family that includes humans. So remember the previous family we talked about was the super family, Hominoidea, that's apes. And then the family that includes humans, not super family, just family, is hominidae, which we call hominins. Funnily enough, or fortunately enough, the molecular clock and the fossil record agree with each other in terms of when this branching event occurred. Molecular clock estimates indicate that the branching of hominins from early apes occurred around five to eight million years ago, and the fossil record indicates that it occurred around six to seven million years ago, which is in agreement. The hominidae subfamily, Australopithecines, was the first major step in the trail that led to human evolution. This subfamily included diverse species, but they all had both ape and human traits. Australopithecus, which is just one genus of the Australopithecines subfamily, originated a little over four million years ago and later gave rise to our Homo genus. It's uncertain whether Australopithecus made and used tools, or at least based on the references I've seen, if you know a more recent reference that has confirmed or denied this, please comment down below. But anyway, they had human similarities of a broader pelvis, which was very important for bipedalism and, as we'll see later, bigger brains. And then they had more ape similarities, non-human ape similarities, in which they kept a lot of their climbing adaptations, like longer arms, and they had a more ape-like skull, but it was slightly larger than previous apes and was moving toward a more human-sized skull. Homo, the genus of Homo that evolved from Australopithecus, 
appeared around 2.4 million years ago, and we are the only modern species of Homo. But that wasn't always the case. Around 2 million years ago, at least two Homo species existed. We can see in this figure just a couple examples of other Homo species, but we'll talk about more later. Australopithecus had a cranial capacity, which is indicative of potential brain size, of around 450 cubic centimeters, while early Homo species had around 760 to potentially over 800 cubic centimeters of cranial capacity. This, as well as wider pelvic bones, indicated that these species were transitioning to more human-like traits. And based on the size of their pelvic bones, early Homo spent most of its time on the ground. One of the early Homo species, Homo habilis, which means handyman, made stone tools called Oldowan tools. Interestingly enough, the oldest homo bones and the oldest stone tools appeared at the same time around 2.4 million years ago. And even though Australopithecines supplemented their mostly vegetarian diet with meat from small animals from time to time, early homo ate much more meat and used their tools to sever meat from the bones. We can tell by scratch marks and tool marks on the bones that we found in association with Oldowan tools. But in terms of the references I've seen, it remains uncertain whether they actively hunted these animals or scavenged them from animals that had been killed by other animals. But before we move from Homo, homo habilis, sorry, I think I said Homo habilis earlier. It's supposed to be Homo habilis, I believe. Anyway, before we move from handyman onto our, you know, chain of Homo species and then humans eventually, let's talk a little bit about that transition from Australopithecines to early Homo because it's a very interesting one. Why would they leave their tree climbing behavior behind in order to walk on land when that puts them at such greater risk? Well, it all comes back to climate change. Basically, Australopithecines kept their tree climbing abilities to find food in the trees and seek safety in the trees from predators. And much like modern chimps, their newborns clutched onto them as their mothers were busy climbing. And so their arms were occupied. So their newborns had to clutch onto them. And this lifestyle prevented bigger brains from evolving. But how is climbing related to bigger brains? Well, this is what we call the helpless baby problem. Well, I don't know if we call it that, but I'm calling it that. Basically, if you're a human mom and you have a newborn, I guarantee it's not clutching onto you so you can use your arms for other things. Yeah, no, it does not. I don't have kids personally, but I've held babies. And if you haven't ever held a newborn, it's like a blob. They can't even hold their own head up. So it's not going to do any clutching. That's for sure. This is about when the brain is developed and how much it's developed by the time the baby is birthed. In monkeys and apes, the brain is mostly developed before and very shortly after birth. And so that baby can very quickly learn to clutch onto its mom while she's climbing. However, in Homo, and that includes us, the brain continues to develop for a full year after birth. This evolutionary transition to larger brains and increased intelligence required what's called delayed maturation, this continued development of the brain after birth. The cons of this delayed maturation of the brain after birth is that we have to take care of our young for longer than other primates do. And so we can't go around doing things with our arms like climbing while our baby is developing. We have to wait for it to be able to clutch onto us for a full year at least. But then the pros of this delayed maturation is brain expansion and intelligence that isn't matched by any other ape that allows Homo and has allowed Homo for many years to cope with environmental changes. So what did climate change have to do with this increase in brain size and delayed maturation? Well, cooling and drying, which was occurring around 2.6 million years ago, forced Australopithecines to abandon their tree climbing lifestyle. Forests were shrinking and grasslands were expanding to the point where trees just weren't available for long expanses of time. And when a population of Australopithecines had finished clearing out all the food in one tree area, they had to travel long distances over open terrain to get to the next tree area to find more food. And when they were doing so, they were obviously subject to predation. Many populations died out as forests shrink, but at least one survived and adapted and eventually evolved into Homo. When they began walking more on two legs, their pelvic bones became larger and their limbs became longer so that they could run longer and walk longer on ground rather than climbing. And as their pelvic bones became larger, bigger brains became possible and the evolutionary mutation of bigger brains became very advantageous as they needed to start outsmarting their predators. 
use. For example, tool making and hunting techniques that came with the increased intelligence of early homo outweigh the cons of helpless babies and allowed them to survive and then thrive. Homo erectus evolved from early homo in Africa around 2 million years ago, and these were even more similar to modern humans than Homo habilis. Homo erectus was also the first hominid to migrate out of Africa to China and Java by 1.9 million years ago, and they produced more advanced tools as a part of their distinctive stone tool culture called Achulian. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't want to offend someone if I'm not saying that right. Interestingly, we used to think that Homo erectus died out around 300,000 years ago. However, then we found evidence that it was actually less than 100,000 years ago that they actually died out. And they seem to have survived isolated on Indonesian islands long after modern humans occupied Africa and Eurasia. Homo erectus survived in Indonesia until at least 100,000 years ago, and recent skeletal findings of very small homo species in cave deposits in the small island of Flores show full-grown adults of around one meter or three feet tall. This population of small homo people on Flores represent evolutionary dwarfing of a small population of homo erectus that had lived there and then evolutionarily became dwarfed, and this dwarf population lived all the way until 18,000 years ago. On geologic timescales, guys, that's very recent. And even more recent was a population of dwarfed elephants that also lived on the island of Flores until 12,000 years ago. How cool would it be to see a dwarfed elephant? I mean, imagine a baby dwarfed elephant. <laughs> In any case, although Homo erectus was more similar to modern humans than previous forms, they still had smaller pelvic bones. Like I mentioned, pelvic bone size limited brain size. However, a later species, Homo heidelbergensis, did evolve larger pelvises and larger brains, but still 20-ish percent smaller brains than modern humans. However, brain size isn't always directly correlated to intelligence. It also has to do with the brain shape and organization of the brain. And that brings us to Neanderthals. Neanderthals lived from around 530 to 32,000 years ago and had larger brains than Homo sapiens, but they were shaped differently. And Homo sapiens or humans have larger frontal and lateral lobes and therefore greater intelligence, even though the Neanderthals had bigger brains, they weren't more intelligent, but they were getting quite close. The lineages of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens branched from a common ancestor around 500,000 years ago, perhaps Homo heidelbergensis or another Homo species around that time. Again, there were multiple and they overlapped with each other. And remember that the fossil record preserves only a very small percentage of what has actually lived. And even if they do become preserved, we haven't found everything. So there's still a lot to uncover, but they branched around 500,000 years ago and Neanderthals developed a more advanced stone tool culture than Homo erectus called Musterian. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but we're going to go with it. And they were hunters. We know that they actively hunted prey. And not only did they hunt animal prey, they also hunted themselves, which we know because tool scrapes on their own bones represented cannibalism. However, they weren't just crazy cavemen people that hunted each other, they also showed capacity for caring and cultural practices. We can tell that they helped out older, potentially injured members of their society to allow them to live much longer than they would have. They also seemed to have religion and they buried their dead, which <laughs> helped out the fossil record quite a bit. <laughs> if only all the early apes would have buried their dead. But moving on now to Homo sapiens, which again, guys, branched off from an earlier common ancestor with Neanderthals rather than evolving from Neanderthals themselves. So there was a branching event and Neanderthals is on one branch and Homo sapiens on the other. Other. We used to think that Homo sapiens, humans, appeared around 150,000 years ago, but recent discoveries from fossil record and genetics indicate that they arose in Africa more than 300,000 years ago. And we not only made more advanced tools, but also had a distinct appreciation for beauty, which hadn't been recognized from previous Homo species. For example, we fashioned shell necklaces and used decorative pigments by 120,000 years ago, and we made it to Europe by 45,000 years ago and Neanderthals then died out 12,000 years later. And whether that's a coincidence or competition, 
I won't get into, but we do know that Neanderthals made their mark on us before they went extinct. Genetic evidence shows that modern Europeans and Asians share more Neanderthal genes than modern Africans. This is because humans and Neanderthals interbred in the Middle East, and humans then carried their excess Neanderthal genes as they spread throughout Europe and Asia. We Homo sapiens invented many new advanced technologies initially with what's called Cro-Magnon culture, with magnificent cave paintings as shown to the right here, sculptures, and even musical instruments. But we soon developed even more sophisticated technology in the late Neolithic culture, and all of these cultural advances were unlike the previous Homo species, which stayed pretty stagnant once they had a tool culture. They just kept going with it. They never really grew out of that stage and evolved other more advanced technologies, whereas we continue to rapidly advance our technologies and our cultures. And I love this figure that shows biological evolution versus cultural evolution. And that is biologically, you know, lineages branch out and diversify, but they don't cross over as much, especially in like human type species and homo species. We're not doing a bunch of lateral gene transfer, but in cultural evolution, the evolution of cultures across populations can branch over a lot. And they have throughout human history. I mean, once homo sapiens evolved and radiated, populations spread rapidly and individually isolated populations populations weren't completely isolated. They took some of their cultural practices from maybe their sister population that they branched off from, and then maybe they met some other societies or cultures along the way, and they took some traits from those cultures. All of these things were branching into each other, and it's just this crazy evolution of cultures across the globe very rapidly since Homo sapiens have evolved, and it's really just cool to think about. But in any case, that's all I have for this video. If you want to check out my major reference, and other minor and sporting references there in my description. The major reference I'm using for this video is Earth System History Book. And if you want to check out related videos about other things that were going on in the Neogene, like tectonic and geologic events or climatic events, you can check out those videos, which if they're out by now, I'll put them on the screen here. But if you want to see other things that have happened throughout Earth's history, I have basically all of Earth's history in my historical geology playlist, and you can click on that playlist whenever it pops up on the screen. Other than that, guys, I am out of here. But before I leave, I will show you my kitty. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. And we will see you. Oh, hope. <gasps> <laughs> you little biscuit. <laughs>